Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to Compass. Uh, our speaker today is Milan Trucic, um, who, uh, in my opinion, is one of the most intelligent people we have here at Rasmus. We know that he always asks very interesting and useful questions, and other people give their seminars. Um, he also organizes his own uh, seminar series, sometimes lunch bites or students teach each other about computer issues and that kind of stuff. So my expectations are high. I think he will do a very good <laughs> seminar. Um, his career is started in uh, Serbia. In 2009, he got a bachelor's degree in meteorology at the University of, at the University of Belgrade. Then uh, while working there, he also worked as a tattoo artist from 2007 to 2009. You can still see it on his arms. Um, then in 2009, he came to Miami, and in uh, 2015, he got a PhD degree here in MPO. Um, he has altogether 20 publications in his publication list. I see uh, about 17 of them are actually peer-reviewed, right? And three of them, uh, he, he is the first author. Um, then he is a co-founder of, of an online service called Cloud Run, where you can buy custom weather predictions uh, done with a numerical model. Um, he's also working on a book about uh, Fortran uh, parallel uh, programming that's uh, somewhere online. It seems to be still developing chapter by almost chapter. Almost done. Almost done. It's expected to come out next year, I think. 475 pages expected and uh, while doing all of that he is working with Brian House here on some projects so there's a lot of stuff going on and um, we will talk today about revised estimates of ocean surface rock in strong winds. Thank you so much Ron and thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm very happy to be here and to have this opportunity to speak to you about what Brian House and I are working at um, at a sustain lab. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, um, wind and waves and turbulence and stress in, in hurricanes um, and pushing the boundary and finding out what happens in very extreme uh, wind conditions. Okay, so the key topic is measuring and parametrizing air-sea drag uh, to improve hurricane prediction. And we're driven by a few key questions is, can we measure drag in hurricane winds? What physical processes govern the drag? And can we better resolve uh, air-sea drag in models uh, to better predict uh, hurricane structure in test? Okay, what is air sea drag. So you can think of it as surface roughness, uh, but also physically drag is basically the rate uh, of momentum transfer. So the vertical transfer of horizontal momentum uh, between atmosphere and ocean. Uh, in very strong winds, what, what happens is wind is blowing over the ocean. Uh, it's generating waves, waves are growing. Uh, waves break, um, they, these white patches that you see, that's waves breaking, forming white caps, so that's um, a lot of foam that gets entrained um, into the subsurface, it also stays into the surface. As waves break, um, they also create spray, uh, and spray is carried by the wind uh, into the atmospheric boundary layer. Some of the spray re-enters the surface, some of the spray um, evaporates or leaves the boundary layer, uh, but a lot of it stays. So this um, loss in visibility going out um, is spraying the boundary layer. And you also see um, what we call streaks. Um, so that's basically as, as waves break, some of the water, uh, particles of water get ejected uh, into the air and then that is carried by the wind Wind also breaks, um, by direct impact, it breaks uh, the tips of crests of um, very steep waves. 
Uh, so as wind carries them, you, you see this kind of a streaky pattern. Now the drag is largely wave dependent. Uh, there's a lot of fast work on that. And also it's extremely difficult to measure in very uh, strong winds like this in the field. Uh, the, the conditions really um, put a limit on uh, the quality of measurements that can be made. And also instruments break in these kind of conditions. They're, the conditions are very violent and instruments get lost. Uh, so overall, extremely difficult to measure uh, drag in these kind of conditions. And this photo is actually from tropical storm force uh, winds. So this is not the most extreme that you get, but this is a good example because you can see stuff. Um, in say category five hurricane conditions, uh, this would probably look all white, like you, you won't be able to see much. And drag is also an essential piece uh, for weather and ocean prediction models because it governs uh, how momentum is lost at the, at the bottom of the atmosphere. Uh, surface boundary conditions likewise forces uh, the ocean, ocean currents. Um, and uh, so for couple atmosphere ocean models and climate models, um, that connection uh, is extremely important for uh, distribution of momentum. So the key finding from um, early 2000s, um, from both the field and laboratory, was that the drag uh, saturates uh, as you go up in wind speed. So here in both of these panels, uh, you have wind, wind speed at 10 meters on the x-axis and drag coefficient on the y-axis. Uh, there's just a little uh, cheat sheet, CD's drag coefficient, and basically that tells you, um, given this much wind, uh, the momentum flux is gonna be this much. So CD uh, relates the wind to momentum flux. So it's a, it's a diagnostic quantity. And it's, it's very popular um, in literature because it sort of gives you like a clear one-to-one -one sort of relationship uh, between flux and wind. Anyhow, so back to the drag saturation. So once you get to about tropical storm, um, category one hurricane, um, Mark Donlan, so he, he was a professor at Rasmus uh, for many years. Um, and the ACES lab at the time, they found that the drag saturates, uh, so it stops growing, it levels off. Uh, Mark Powell and colleagues uh, from AOML, they, they found very similar a bit before. Um, similar result um, about the drags, though this is from GPS drop sounds um, from the aircraft, so they sample Basically, they have a Lagrangian trajectory as they fall to the atmospheric boundary layer, and you can fit a log profile to that and extract stress from wind profiles. And they, they also found a saturation and maybe a decrease, although um, the number of samples are not as high, and there's a high spread, and also uncertainty coming from the nature of um, using drop sounds for, for something like this. And this was a high impact result because very soon it was incorporated into weather and ocean prediction models. Uh, for example, in the wharf, uh, in 2007, this was built into the tropical um, physics package uh, for, for hurricanes in wharf. Uh, and th that's still in there. So basically, if you choose that the tropical setting number two, in war, if you'd get this for uh, for momentum transfer, uh, even though this was a re result um, from the laboratory, not not from the field. Um, so this that that connection from from data to the models is a is an important point that I'll get back to in a bit. Why does drag saturate in strong winds? Um, there's a few hypotheses out there, and 
different researchers um, have have their favorites. Um, we have um, sheltering and flow separation. Um, I'll explain what it is. Uh, that's one of the key hypotheses that was also suggested um, by Mark and colleagues uh, in 2004 as explanation for this leveling off. Another one is that spray and bubbles form a multi-phase layer that suppresses turbulence. Uh, I'll get to it. And also we have potentially wave tearing from direct impact by wind. So this, this is the mechanism where I said that the waves um, can get really steep and the wind really strong that it directly impacts and carries off some of that water and essentially dissipate waves directly. So what's sheltering and flow separation? Um, if you're like me and you took Tamai's GFD1, uh, he made all students back then, 2009, to, to buy this book, uh, an album of fluid motion. And it's basically a collection of these awesome photographs from um, well, basically laboratory fluid dynamic studies. So sheltering and flow separation, basically you have uh, flow going over this um, obstacle sort of a sloping down surface and here in the lee of that um, solid surface you have sort of stagnating flow uh, recirculation. Uh, and in a more extreme example here you have a soft sort of solid block barrier and flow going over it and you have this sort of shadow, shadow area. And this has been observed um, in real waterways also especially in the lab, for example, my, my favorite illustration is from Bakhtin Veron 2016, where he used um, PIV, basically that's taking high-speed photographs of, um, of particles in the air flowing over, over a water surface. Um, in stronger winds, going down you have higher, higher and steeper waves. And here, especially in these uh, bottom two, you see very clear, uh, basically, reduction in air, air velocity. So it has this shadow effect. So basically what it does in, in high winds over waves, the flow would then skip from crest to crest and not re-enter the trough in between waves, and that creates smoother flow uh, over water. I also mentioned that spray and bubbles form a multi-phase layer that suppresses turbulence. So the way that works is say you have a breaking wave and, and you have um, water particles and, and spray from that breaking that are separated uh, from the water surface. And now the wind carries that uh, in, the, in the surface layer. Some of it evaporates, some of it um, drops out, but Overall, in the equilibrium, you, you end up having this sort of multi-phase layer where you don't have um, a discrete transition from liquid water to uh, to gas, uh, but you have sort of a more gradual uh, transition in density because you have that intermediate layer. And this is an example from. Uh, high resolution volume of fluid simulations um, that illustrates that effect. So you have waves growing, breaking, uh, some water particles separate at the crests and that's being picked up by the wind. So you end up having this, this layer and the idea is that in this layer, um, turbulent vortices are being, uh, being dampened and suppressed. So then that results in a smoother flow. Finally, wave tearing by direct impact. Basically, imagine you have wind flowing over a steep wave, uh, and wave just the, the wind just breaks off the tip, tip of that wave, and you have uh, generation of uh, spume, um, and what ends up showing up as streaks uh, in photographs that I showed earlier. But the key point here is that 
not only this is being generated, but the wave is being dissipated uh, by direct impact from wind. And this is, this is a photo, series of photographs um, you know, from Fabrice Laurent uh, in the lab. Uh, these are, I think, you know, millisecond or less um, one from another, or a small number of milliseconds in between. But you see how that works uh, in, in sequence. So I mentioned this basically manifests as um, streaks. Um, and here, this is, I'm, I'm showing you work from uh, Leopold Tuisen and, and colleagues. Uh, th this work is closely related to Mark Powell's um, drops on and drag analysis from 2003. And basically, they coupled um, the drag to the photographs of the surface from NOAA aircraft. Uh, so here, for example, uh, they give you what the surface looks like at 13 meter per second, 30, 47. Here you have some white caps. Uh, here you have a lot of white caps, breaking waves, and some streaks. Uh, and here you have what they call a whiteout. And they do image analysis uh, to differentiate between white caps, streaks, and clear surface. And then they map that to the drag. So here, the, the top panel is drag is function of wind speed. Wind speed is uh, here on this axis. It increases with wind. So these are um, a large number of uh, field measurements. Uh, and then the purple here are also drop sound uh, estimates from, from this paper. Uh, but the key point here is that here the quantified white caps and streaks and they hypothesize that this, the, the saturation and then perhaps drop off in drag happens when you have this drastic increase in streaks. Uh, streaks getting close to one basically means a complete whiteout. Uh -huh. So the idea is that once you get to here, that creates like almost completely smooth, uh, smooth flow over the water surface, and then that will result in a drop. Track. And how I got to here to now do this work on. Um, so, in my first few years as a PhD student, I was um, very lucky to get to work uh, with Mark Donlan. Um, those were his last few years before he retired. Uh -huh. And basically, we made together this, this new model, um, a wave model, uh, that that was very easy, and still, still is, designed to be very easy to, to couple with atmosphere and ocean models. But more importantly, it was the first model to, to connect uh, wave evolution and stress uh, in a physically consistent way. And actually, at the same time, um, in the same issue, there, there was also this paper. So this is the same paper that, um, that I was showing you white caps and streaks from. Uh, they, they came out independently, but you know, eventually uh, uh, they led sort of, the two concepts are, are now coming together with what we're trying to do in the Sustain Lab. 2012, so, so I wrote here, important year for waves and stress. In 2012, I think also um, MTLSS building with the Sustain Lab was being constructed um, and finished. So, uh, Basically, a few years ago, I, I talked with Brian uh, uh, about what, what we could do together, and he said, you know, one, one of the main reasons we wanted to, to build this was to really study this uh, drag, but in extreme wind conditions that were previously not possible. What's this picture on the top? Oh, I, I pulled that from the the old MPLSS website, it's, it's like an artist's depiction of what the building will look like. Oh. It, it doesn't look like that, but I think it looks better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that brings us to 
to our current project, which is a um, three-year NSF project to quantify and parameterize drag uh, in extreme winds. Uh, first year is done, two more to go, and this talk is about what we learned so far. And the project is basically laid out as in year one will reproduce uh, the drag from momentum budget results by Mark Donovan with Im improved instruments and methods and give error estimates. So this step um, is very important because first we need to be able to reproduce uh, existing results and to make, to make sure that um, everything works as we think it works. Um, troubleshoot any issues. So we're doing this in the same tank um, that Mark Donald did, but the tank moved from the old building. That building is not here anymore. They tore it down. And they moved it to, uh, to sustain. But it's the same tank. Uh, one key difference is that um, back then they had a tank, uh, they had wind recirculation. Uh, so it's, it's a closed loop, so it keeps some of the momentum as you uh, drive the winds. Uh, now we don't have the closed loop. We have an uh, inlet from, from the outside outlet to the outside. Uh, and that it's in a new building. So those are the only difference, but it's the same thing. Um, so we were hoping we'd be able to reproduce the results. In year two, we then do this experiment, but in a uh, much bigger tank with much higher winds, uh, and derive a new wave growth parameterization that would take into account these processes that occur in extreme winds, such as um, spring bubble generation and wind bearing. Not explicitly model these, but model the effect of them on wave growth. And in year three, we plan to evaluate uh, the new function in coupled simulations of real hurricanes. Okay, so the, the key um, of the method um, of Mark Donald's 2004 work was the momentum budget. Why? Uh, because I re remember I said that the conditions are very violent uh, at these high wind speeds and conventional uh, measurements and instruments stop working. So, for example, if we measure flux in, with, um, with a sonic anemometer, uh, the spray that gets generated uh, by wind and waves uh, begins to pollute the, the measurement volume and you end up with, with crap data with, in these very... Uh, high wind conditions. Uh, another one, uh, another instrument that is that, that we use in the lab is the so-called hot wire anemometer, which are these um, tiny wires that if they get hit by spray, uh, they just burn out. Uh, so what Markdown and colleagues did is uh, they constructed this momentum budget framework in the tank. Uh, so basically, you start from the uh, momentum balance. So this is here, the U is the velocity for, for water. So this is the, the budget for the water. Uh, maybe one um, less common term for the general audience is the wave radiation stress. So that's an integral term that comes in when you have waves. That basically tells you how much mom mean momentum is transported uh, by waves being there. Here in the pressure gradient, we also have, so this is the uh, mean slope of the water surface, but we also have the gradient in the air pressure. So this, this term exists, for example, in, in ocean models where you have a low pressure basically gives you, through hydrostatic balance, uh, an elevated sea surface height. In the tank, that's important because when we uh, drive very high winds, we actually have a strong air pressure gradient in the tank and we need to account for it. And then this is a surface stress. This is what we're after. Now it's, it's sort of common to, uh, to drop small terms. Um, so 
here we're calling that batch and small and cross it out. And in the lab, we, we run things for some time and then measure things at steady state or what we assume is steady state. So this can also drop out. So now we're left with these four terms and you can integrate in the vertical and rearrange things to get um, air, air sea stress uh, on the left and then mean surface slope, pressure gradient, wave radiation stress, and bottom stress on the right. So we, if we can measure these, then we can back out our stress indirectly. Uh, so actually, it's you know the, the concept is is pretty simple when you illustrate it. It's, it's really just this box. So this is um, the tank or a slice of the tank. Uh, as the wind blows over the water, it pushes the um, water forward, but because it's a closed uh, box, you, you get this um, increase in slope. So if we can measure all these terms at this end and at this end, then we can back out stress. This is what the, our laboratory setup looks like. Um, uh, so there's a lot of things going on, so I'll, I'll go um, slowly. I'm showing uh, basically the setup from both 2004 and what we did last year. Uh, this study is in red, so everything you see in red is what we did. And basically, remember how uh, we need to calculate these gradients from, from the two, se two sections. Uh, that's why each term needs to have a measurement on in, at one point in the tank and another measurement in the other. So then you can calculate the gradient. So for example, in 2004 experiments, uh, the mean elevation and, and wave measurements were taken at this section, and then the pressure gradient was taken here. So that's sort of the drag results are representative of that section of the tank. Uh, what we did is it, we wanted to expand that uh, to sort of get as much of um, all the growing wave conditions in the tank. So we have these uh, measurements set up closer to the inlet and further out closer to the beach. And in addition, we also do some high-speed camera imaging. So these are the, the pink rectangles that you see. Basically, we take high-speed photographs from uh, the side of the tank. So here's a photo of the lab setup in action. This is one of the cameras. So we light up the water from the other side of the tank. And then we, we take high-speed images of these three sections in the tank, and that will give us an opportunity to back out uh, high frequency water elevation at all of these points as function of time and fetch, which will give us some very interesting uh, wave results. Okay, so I'll start with the drag uh, results. Hey, uh, mm -hmm. no, just to Go ahead. So the term myself and maybe a lot of people here are at least familiar with it's like the wave stress term, right? So how do you actually measure that? You, can you get that just from the height of the surface, the volume time, or? Yeah, basically it's an, uh, you take, you have time series of water elevation. Mm -hmm. uh, you take a Fourier transform, transform to get a spectrum. And then it's integrated in a, in a special way and it gives you this transform term. So it's related to wave energy. But you're, so you're inferring uh, SXX from some measurement of the water surface? Yes. Right, from the actual waves themselves? Yes. That's a, that's a pretty robust measurement. Okay. So the black symbols here are Donlan 2004 results. Uh, here you see the saturation I mentioned earlier. And these are our new results. Different symbols are different uh, metals. So we had a, a hot wire and sonic anemometer uh, 
up to a certain point. Uh, and circles are momentum budget. We also added, um, we, we computed the, the air estimates. So basically for, for hot wire and sonic, that's relatively straightforward. And for momentum budget, you need to get instrument errors for each of the terms and then propagate that error to all the way to the, to the stress. And you see that momentum budget errors are largest of all. Uh, and smaller wind speeds. And that, that's because simply that the mean water slope is the main, that's the dominant term, but in low winds, that term is very small. So you're getting closer and closer to uh, the instrument accuracy. That's why this, uh, this bar is big. For the hot wire, we also have bars in there, but they're smaller than uh, symbols. Now, What's great is that we can reproduce this. If the drag levels off, um, that's the result we were hoping for. Sort of the first question mark is why are altogether our results a bit higher than Mark Donald's results? Uh, they're almost shifted above. And then I started looking into other data. Uh, what did others find? So first I, I look at sort of a compendium of, of field data from from stations and buoys. So that's summarized by Jim Edson, 2013. So that's in stars. Uh, and these bars are standard deviation of, um, of all the measurements. So that's these bars are natural variabilities in contrast to our bars, which are instrument errors. OK, so now actually it turns out that our new data um, uh, lays com compared to the field data much uh, much better. Uh, so that made me thinking, um, like why why would these values be so low? Uh, and then we kept comparing. We also looked at the lab data by a Japanese group. Uh, they also found uh, saturation. Uh, these values are also somewhat low. Okay, now we have, we have these data and we have this code, so then I started looking um, how, how it was all calculated. And in calculating our own momentum budget estimates, I actually went through a lot of Mark Donald's original code to really understand how the method works. And I found something interesting. What, what looked like um, like an error in in the analysis, and there was a simple correction uh, that they applied, and the error is not not in the data. So the stress stress data um, are what they are, but notice that here I'm showing on the x-axis wind at 10 meters, uh, but. Our, our tank is one meter high. We're not measuring a 10 meter wind speed. We're measuring wind speed inside the tank and then we're scaling it to 10 meters using the stress and the log profile. Okay. Uh, so the issue that I found in the original analysis really comes in that scaling. What was the original value that was used to, to, to calculate the, the U10 and then to calculate the CD at 10 meters. Uh, so first, I'm just showing you the correct data before I show you the correction. So when I corrected it, basically all it did is it just shifts the values a bit higher. So the, the fundamental result doesn't change. You still have drag saturation. And you can argue that in the lab, the actual magnitude where all these values lie is not as important because it's, you can't quite directly translate it to the field. But the fun, fundamental result uh, remains, uh, is that you get this saturation. Now, why the, the, the actual magnitude of where this saturates and at what level it saturates is very important because these values end up being used in prediction models. So 
even though all of these results mean something in a specific context, um, in specific lab or field conditions, if you end up using them in a weather model and then apply it in general, uh, in then that actual value begins to matter a lot. Because going from here to here is about a 50% difference in magnitude. Okay, so the correction, so this was the original um, Mark Dolan 2004 data, and this is uh, the same figure. Uh, I talked about this in the previous slide. So I'm just gonna show you where the correction comes in. I said that stress data are, are what they are, uh, but to get to the wind speed of 10 meters, you take the measured wind speed uh, and you scale it with the log and the friction velocity. So friction velocity is basically the stress that you measure. So that gives you U10, and then you calculate CD at 10 meters by dividing uh, the friction velocity squared with wind speed squared. So I went back through the code and I went back through all the data that gets you from stress to this to this, and it turns out that the original analysis, the UC, which is the measured wind speed, uh, was actually this estimated um, extrapolated curve from four profile measurements, which were a related but separate, um, separate set of runs. So the, the, the profile estimates of drag are in, in this paper, but all of the other methods use this in C2 wind speed, which is an estimate, rather than the measured one, which is a solid in black. Now to kind of really do a sanity check of what's, what's true here, I also laid out our own new measured uh, wind speed in red. So x-axis is basically the fan speed. You can think of it as no wind to the strongest wind we can generate, and we control it as um, fan speed in hertz, uh, and then we measure wind speed uh, with our instrument, and this is what we get. Uh, so now you see that our measured uh, compares pretty well with marks measured, but it doesn't, it doesn't compare well with the estimates that were used to scale the wind to 10 meters and then to drag. So to make a correction, it's pretty easy actually. You just have to uh, you have the stress, and you need to take the actual measured wind speed, calculate new U10, which will now be a bit lower because the measured wind speed is lower, and then calculate the new drag, which will, which will be a bit higher because the wind is lower. And I just, I just described this slide. So that was the correction, and now I'm going to tell you a little bit about our, the second part of our experiment, which is trying to look at uh, can, we, can we look at a drag in a more mature <laughs> wave conditions uh, by basically introducing a, a pedal wave in the tank. Uh, so what we did is we ran the same set of experiments, uh, but we added this um, paddle away with eight centimeter um, significant height in one second period. So this is an example from that side imaging uh, method that we did. So this, this wave is uh, basically almost a sign. Uh, it's, it's, it's about this high. And then we, we do everything all over again. We just uh, run um, various wind speeds over that. And then something very interesting happened, at least very interesting to me. Uh, in wind-only experiments, remember how we had uh, the drag saturation. But when we add the paddle, the drag actually keeps increasing and then saturates uh, at a higher magnitude 
and at a higher value of, of wind. And then I started looking into waves. Uh, because the only thing that we did different here is by adding a pedal wave. Uh, and that led to, a, to an increase in drag and a later saturation. Uh, and this, this panel shows you significant wave height. That's basically just a common integrated quantity that tells you of um, how, how high are the waves in the thing. And on the x axis, we have wind speed scale to 10 meters. So if we didn't have uh, a paddle wave, basically waves grow up to this point and then saturate very much like drag. And then when we add a paddle, now our wave height starts here. Uh, slowly increases and then suddenly increases further up to here. So now this is 25 centimeter height. So th these are fairly fairly big waves. And then you have a, a stop, a basic saturation wave height as well. And now the key takeaway here is that the saturation in wave heights seem to correspond very well to the saturation in in drag. They happen sort of at the same wind speed. Yeah, basically these were my uh, takeaways. So, considering that with paddle, now waves can grow further, um, it makes you ask why do the waves stop growing at a certain point if you didn't, didn't have a paddle. So the high-speed camera imaging that we did gives us an opportunity to look at uh, wave growth um, as a function of both wind speed and fetch. So remember how we had the three, three sections of the tank where we did the imaging, and now we can look at um, wave heights in sort of this uh, 2D view as function of both fetch and wind. So in wind-only experiment, uh, basically you have, you can pick any, uh, any section and go up with, uh, with wind. So if the waves increase, then at some point they level off. Fine. When we add the paddle, uh, we found a very different behavior. Basically, as you go up with wind speed, you have a much higher increase in waves. So now this is about three times as high waves as here. Another very interesting thing is that at the very far fetch of the tank, you actually have a local minimum in wave heights. So if you look at this third panel, and you go up with wind speed, the waves increase, and then they suddenly decrease. You can also look at it as looking at just high winds, but from left to right, you have an increase and then you have a sudden decrease. So what happens there? So to study this more, basically I looked at um, raw images and some more in-depth um, spectral analysis, which I'll show in the next slide. But I want to show you what these regimes look like in the image. So this is basically a clean wave, low winds. Here you have very high and steep breaking wave. And then here you have a highly dissipated uh, wave field with a lot of spray. Spray you can't really see in this, these images, uh, but it's there if you saw it um, with, uh, with your own eyes. Uh, but what you can see in the images is a lot of bubbles being entrained here. So these, these waves are very intensely breaking, but they're also being completely swept and limited in growth by, by the wind impact. Now, I would show you some lovely uh, movies of this, uh, but I couldn't, my, my laptop's pretty old, so it gets bogged down with, uh, with movies and PowerPoints. Uh, 
so I could do just image. But basically through, through spectral analysis, um, so just to give you an idea, you do a Fourier transform of the elevation time series, and you get a distribution of basically wave energy as function of frequency. So on the left are longer waves, and on the right are shorter waves. So waves grow from right to left. Um, red is wind only, uh, green is wind and paddle. And here this very sharp and steep peak uh, is, is our paddle wave. Now I need to give you a, a caveat here is that when, uh, when I was designing this experiment, I didn't have you know, enough forethought to, uh, to more carefully set the conditions, basically. I knew I wanted to add some paddle waves, and I basically came in and said, what's the biggest paddle wave we can make to really you know, get as much contrast in the two experiments? Uh, but in, in talking to, with, with Will, he point, pointed out that you know these kinds of um, wave spectrum where we have this very sharp and narrow uh, a long wave and a very separated wind sea, that's something you can never really observe in the field. Uh, so it's sort of, um, it gives you a very exaggerated effect of the, the processes at play, so even the drag uh, the higher drag that we get from that experiment is probably the high upper bound of what's likely to happen. And basically we need to sort of couple, couple mechanically generated waves and wind see more carefully and more um, closely together. And ideally wider banded to more closely mimic the waves in the field. Uh, the black here is uh, the spectrum from Mark Donland, just showing you this, that it agrees very well with the red spectrum, which is a confirmation of the, uh, of the method that everything we're doing is uh, hopefully correct. Uh, and here I just want to show you some evidence of sheltering by the paddle wave, and you see it is that this, the wind sea in the green actually grows, grows to be much weaker than the wind sea in the absence of the paddle wave. And what happens is that the paddle wave is really long and, and high, that it shelters the shorter waves uh, from the wind, so they don't get to grow as much. But the, the paddle wave grows uh, gets to grow in higher winds. So what we also find evidence is that as you go higher in wind speed, uh, so here wind speed is shown uh, in the upper right corner, as you go higher actually you get a decrease in paddle wave energy and some of that energy is distributed forward to even longer waves. So that comes from this direct dissipation by wind. Anyhow, wrapping up, uh, next steps, we're going to uh, do this experiment uh, more carefully designed and with more instruments uh, in, a, in a bigger tank that creates much stronger winds, uh, allows for deeper water, uh, longer fetch. Uh, so we're hoping to get uh, the first insight into drag at very extreme uh, wind speeds. Uh, Category 5 hurricane equivalent. And then we're going to work on basically connecting waves and stress and including these processes in extreme conditions. Don't worry too much about these equations, so I just want to show you that this is the wave energy balance, this is what models do. And here you have wave growth, wave dissipation, and nonlinear transfer. And this wave growth function is what connects the waves to stress. So currently, for example, this form of the function is basically proportional to the uh, wind relative to phase speed of the wave 
squared, but the, the square is sign preserving. So you see here we have absolute values and parentheses so that, um, for example, wind opposing waves would give you a, a negative input or decaying waves. Uh, and then if you integrate this over the spectrum, you get the form drag. And form drag is part of the stress. So that's the, that's the connection between wave energy balance, wave growth, and stress. And currently, operational wave models don't do this. And they should be doing this, I think. And the way we're going to expand this is so here there's this um, magical number, which is the sheltering coefficient. Uh, typically, this has been a tunable parameter in models, and both lab and field work try to find uh, the value of this number as a, as a parameter. But maybe this is not a tunable parameter. Maybe it's a more complex function because, well, this function doesn't include uh, physical processes that happen in, in higher wind speeds. For example, direct impact uh, by wind. Uh, and given that we, we measure wave energy, we measure everything here, and we measure stress, we can work toward trying to more, to, to better describe this um, sheltering coefficient, we, which may not be uh, a coefficient after all. Uh, that's how I think about it. So, Think of it as instead of a number a, this expands into a bit, bit wider function that takes into account these other processes. And finally, we're going to evaluate this in, in couple modeling of hurricanes. When we proposed this work, um, I, had, I had different storms in mind. So that was like 2017 when we wrote this. and. I did, you know, the latest storms um, weren't as strong, so there weren't as many major, major hurricanes um, that were in very recent history in this area that we could relate our uh, lab lab work to. But more recently, since 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 the proposal was granted and uh, we started working on this. We had quite a few, unfortunately, uh, major hurricanes to impact the area. So we'll probably focus more uh, on these. And basically, we're going to use existing frameworks uh, to, to carry out the simulations and try to learn something new about how this works in major hurricanes. Anyhow, these are my takeaways. Um, we can reproduce the drag in the lab. That's great. In the process, we found an error in previous results and proposed a correction. This is not a fundamental change um, of a result, but may have important implications for, for models. Wave growth and drag and strong winds is sensitive to the presence of background waves, uh, but we need to more carefully design our experiments so that uh, we can better relate it to what happens in the field. And right now we're preparing to do that. And that's it, I'll end here. Um, I'd like to thank everybody here. It takes a village, they all helped uh, with this work. And I'll take your questions. Uh, I got, we have to go to a conference call, so I'm gonna ask a few questions okay. right away. Um, so the first second question, you know, the formula that we're using in the work model right now, it, uh, it's, the CD formula kind of starts at a pretty low, high value, and it goes down a lot, and then goes way back up. And oh, in very low winds, it yeah, starts high. it goes way down. But your values are higher at the low winds, or all the values you showed. So is that a... Is that a they are. Is that um, an error or just a, a bad function in the model? Now, that doesn't matter too much at 10 meter per second winds, but it could matter in Genesis. Or yeah, no, that's, so that's... That's the laminar. The, those high values come from laminar flow. So that's before you get to the turbulent right, right. flow. So um, 
Yes, I, I think the minimum I, is lower than I don't. Other. I don't trust our measurements in those very low winds, but oh, okay. we'll we'll make have a good idea about this. Yeah, certainly. Let's see if you take the, the sign into account. What what often happens with with the older data sets that have that is that they didn't start magnitude on it, so you end up basically with a whole lot of things looking high. In fact. A whole lot of those are actually negatives. Mm. So if you put the sign into account properly and then take the average, it drops right down. So I, I think the work model is probably low wind. Low wind. I mean, it's low wind, but you're basically in the middle of the three. Uh, so my second question, my second question is: um, Do you consider right? So you basically have you know your tank and you got little waves, and then you're also putting on paddle waves. So it, do you imagine that as like an actual modeling of the ocean surface, or is it like a scaled down version of big waves on little waves, like in a real hurricane? More modeling. You see what I'm saying? Like, in other words, like, would you see the paddle waves, like you're talking about paddle waves, like doing things that you talked about swell or big ocean waves doing. So do you think you're actually modeling what the, doing a scaled down version of what the big ocean waves are doing? Okay, or, so or are you actually modeling what wind waves do, like of about the same size? So these paddle waves are not swell, and I'm careful to not call them swell okay. because swell is faster in the wind. Uh, so swell, so out, swell out transport. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but these these waves, even our paddle waves, are, you know, once you get beyond, I don't know, a few meters per second. Mm -hmm they're slower than the winds. So that's still, that's really just a very uh, narrow banded background wave. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how else I'd call it. It's not windsy, it's not generated by the wind. Okay. It aims, it aims to give you um, a more mature wave, but it's not more mature as in the wind has blown over the surface for a longer time or over a longer distance, so they're not equivalent. So they're not, these results are not, the drag is not exactly relatable to the field, but I think this experiment still gives us insight about what physically happens at very high winds when you have a longer wave and when you don't. So in, in the big tank, we'll be able to put in battle waves that are, say, a John Swap spectrum. So. It, it, it could give you a much more realistic background field than what we did in the small deck. Okay. All right, thanks. About 20, 25 meters okay. per second. Is that comparable to the other, the other measurements? Yeah, to, to most of them. Um, so Mark Donald's old results, they're at like 32, 33 meter per second. If, if you look at our correction, that, that goes a bit uh, lower in terms of wind speed. So now, the saturation, because U10 becomes a bit lower and drag becomes higher, you end up having that transition sooner. Unfortunately, this is also about where the field data becomes very scarce. So we don't know much more what happens from in the, in the field. The paddle, the way you change different frequency, or it was always the same. Yeah, no, I wish. The thing is, even just the wind only experiments, and I didn't mention this, but we did both fresh and salt water, and the results are quite consistent. Uh, there's, I mean, it's so much work yeah, yeah, to yeah. do just one run that basically one paddle condition was sort of my you know, my own soft limit to what should we do and what should we say, okay, we're happy with this and let's work with this. But in retrospect, 
yes, we would have planned this more carefully and maybe would try different frequencies. Definitely lower amplitude because this, this wave is really high. What do you think the actual mechanism for the increased coefficient is under the high waves? Is it the, the angle that the wind is near the sea surface? Um, yeah, I mean, it's basically what you get is a very, very um, rough, long, long, and, long and high and steep waves are basically like speed bumps to the flow. Um, and because wind is so much faster, like it doesn't matter that these long waves are propagating faster. So they're not swell waves in that sense. Um, obviously, yeah, these long waves add to the roughness. Um, and we see that from looking at the wave growth of that paddle wave. As we go higher in, in wind, we see that, that the paddle wave gets energy from the wind up until a certain point. Then when the wind gets really, really high, like 45, 50 meter per second, then that paddle wave begins to dissipate more. So then you see a decrease in paddle wave height with wind. And that's from this, what I believe is direct impact from wind. Thanks. So okay. I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So if you had a, you're saying you had a smaller paddle wave, right? You use the biggest one you can do, then it might represent a, kind of a background sea state, like maybe from non-local forcing in the ocean. It still wouldn't be. We would just be less unrealistic to say. Okay. So, uh, but models currently. I'm not a modeler, so do models currently assume sort of a zero background state when you're modeling in a hurricane? Oh, so mod models develop full um, wind sea and swell. No problem. The, the whole the whole range of waves is modeled. So you're already taking into account this sort of amplification of that kind of model. No, I mean all of these effects that I talked about. None of that is in the models right now. Okay, if there are no okay. further questions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you again. Thank you all for coming. Next week we have uh, Josefina speaking.